For the last 18 hours, only the plasmids have been replicating in each well of this plate. Now we are ready for the actual sequencing part. When we sequence DNA, we want to determine the identity of each nucleotide and the order. We explained that we can tell the identity of each nucleotide in the sequence by using a fluorescent terminating nucleotide. We determine the order by building many copies of different portions of the target DNA, all from the same start point. We then line up all the different lengths of replicated DNA segments from shortest to longest and read the terminating nucleotide by shooting it with a laser to make it fluoresce. But how do we determine where the copying begins? What is preventing us from copying a portion of the plasmid or the E. coli DNA, which is also floating around in the same solution? Well, if you remember, PUC18 plasmid and E. coli have known genomic codes. Also, the sheared segments of DNA that we want to sequence were inserted in a very specific location in the plasmid DNA. The breaking point where we inserted the sheared segment of DNA into the plasmid was in the LACZ gene that turned colonies of E. coli bacteria blue. So we know the sequence of nucleotides before and after the segment of shear DNA that we inserted. In order to start the replication process, we need primers that give the polymerase a place to start replicating the DNA sequence. We chose primers that fit immediately to the left or right of the area where the inserted fragments sit. That way we know exactly where the starting point of the replication begins. Okay, so back to our 384 well plates full of plasmids. We know that we can start copying the target segments of DNA inserted into the plasmid, either forward or backward along the plasmid, depending on which primer we use. However, we can't sequence the DNA if we start replicating segments of DNA both forward and backward in the same well. So we take the solution from each well and transfer it to two new 384 well plates using robots. We then add forward primers to one set and reverse primers to the other set. Next, we add more free nucleotides, tack polymerase to assemble the new strands, and the fluorescently marked nucleotide. This then goes on to a thermocycler. The thermocycler repeatedly heats and cools the solution to start and stop the segment replication process. Let's take a look at how this works. At the beginning of the cycle, the solution is heated to 95 degrees Celsius. This causes the DNA to unzip and separate into two single strands of DNA. The temperature is then lowered to 50 degrees Celsius. At this point, the primers settle onto the single strands of the DNA. The temperature is then raised to 60 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, the tag polymerase is activated and starts assembling DNTPs along the single strand of DNA until it randomly incorporates a fluorescently marked nucleotide, or DDNTP. At this point, the chain is stopped. The temperature is then raised again to 95 degrees Celsius, and the segment that had just been made separates from the plasmid DNA. The temperature is then lowered to 50 degrees Celsius, and a new primer settles on the plasmid DNA, and the cycle repeats. The reactions are cycled from 20 to 99 times. The millions of segments this process creates, each with fluorescent terminating nucleotides, are called Sanger fragments because they are the result of the Sanger method of sequencing. Here is our 384 well plate that's been sitting on the thermocyclers for a while. Inside this plate are millions of copies of Sanger fragments. There are also millions of lysed E. coli cells and unused reagents. Before we can proceed, we have to separate the Sanger fragments from the other debris in the wells. To isolate the Sanger fragments, carboxyl-covered microscopic magnetic beads suspended in an ethanol solution are added to each well in the plate. In a strong ethanol solution, the carboxyl coating strongly attracts the phosphate backbone of DNA. The carboxyl coating on the beads only sticks to the DNA. All the other bits of cellular debris and reagent remain suspended in solution. Next, a magnet is applied to the bottom of the plate, which draws all the beads and the attached bits of DNA to the bottom of the well. All the other debris is then washed away with an ethanol rinse. The magnet is removed and the excess ethanol is allowed to evaporate. Next, water is added to each well. The water causes the DNA to be released from the bead into solution. A magnet is then applied again to draw the beads toward the bottom. The solution of water and DNA is then drawn off and put into a new plate, leaving the magnetic beads at the bottom of the old plate. 
What we have here is a 384 well plate with purified DNA and Sanger fragments. This is what we'll load onto the sequencing machine and read tomorrow.